everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just want to welcome you here to Emmanuel. And uh, I hope that you have uh, uh, come prepared today uh, to expect God to be at work in your life. And he does that a number of ways. Sometimes it's just by the conversation you had before you walked into the auditorium uh, that somebody greeted you uh, and engaged you and talked to you and you were reminded of God's love or care just because somebody cared for you. Uh, also, I hope that you're open to what God wants to do in terms of teaching. We're going to open the Word of God today, and one of the things that God does, He uses that as His means of grace, His way of, of giving His favor to people, His undeserved favor, as He teaches us about who He is and who we are. The Holy Spirit is going to be at work in conjunction with that when our hearts are disposed to listen. So I hope that you're open to what God wants to do today, and you're anticipating that. And I know for some of you, as it is for me, I always uh, joke with uh, uh, the people who lead in worship is that sometimes, I don't know if you find this about yourself, when I get into a moment of praise and worship, uh, as I praise the name of God, it takes me back into my week. It takes me back into the, the difficulties and challenges of this week. And this week has been a dark week in the life of Xenia. It's been a hard week uh, on top of the other things that have happened uh, in our country. Uh, and... I need to be reminded of where security lies. I need to be reminded where the answer is found. I need to be reminded where hope lies. All those things need to happen. And in that kind of moment, I find myself in just this kind of welter of, of thoughts and emotions that kind of just uh, somehow works its way up through my soul and leaks out my eyes uh, as I do that. So I hope that uh, you come disposed to listen and we need to hear uh, even if you've had a hard week, one of the things that you need to be is you just need to be sitting here and letting God soften you again and remind you of his presence uh, as we gather together. Well, I want to continue a series that we have begun. Really, we've been here the whole year. This might uh, be a record for Emmanuel in terms of the length of a series. Uh, we're breaking all the rules and what they tell you in having a series that probably people get worn out or tired out, but we hope that that's not the case. Uh, and we've been trying to work through the main doctrines of our church. And doctrines just are the teachings, and the reason why they are the teachings of the church that guide and direct our understanding of who we are, of how we operate, of what we think our mission is, of our identity. The reason why is because we believe that Scripture teaches it. And we've tried to distinguish between the teaching of Scripture that calls for a response of obedience and then where there's principles that are laid out in Scripture that call for wisdom on the people of God and how to implement them. So today, we're talking about one of those areas where we believe God teaches about the way the church should be organized. And we're going to call it church polity. That's the way theologians talk about it, but we'll come and we'll define that for you. But we're continuing the discussion on the church, right? And you'll see this term up here, and I've used it over and over again. I don't want it to be an in-house term. Uh, if you're visiting with us, that, that big old term, ecclesiology, is how you say that term. It's a mashup of two Greek words, ecclesia, church, assembly, really is what it means, and logos, which is a discourse or a word about the nature of the church. And so in the history of God's people, as they've tried to understand who they are and how they're to operate, there's a subsection of our understanding of ourselves called ecclesiology. And so that's what we're talking about today. And so far, we've talked about what the church is, and the church is all the people who have believed in Jesus Christ recognize that they're lost, they needed salvation, they need to be delivered from their sin, they needed purpose, direction, and meaning because they recognized they were rebels against the God who had made them, and they put their faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for them and resurrected to give them life. They put their faith in him and him alone, they become a part of God's people. And that applies to all of the people in the biblical storyline from the time of Christ's coming to the time of Christ's return. That's the church. And then we talk about the purpose of the church, right? To have God's heart. God is a God who desires everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so the, the heart of God's people is to go and make disciples, introduce people to Jesus and grow them in their relationship to Jesus. And we're also to do that as a group of people who are united around Jesus. Now, last time we were talking about, whoops, I should turn on the, the, the green button here, right? To move myself forward. Uh, we're talking about how the church is structured. So one thing is to know, well, who is the church? Second is, what's our purpose as a church? And the third thing is, 
well, how should we organize ourselves as a church? And if you're uh, aware of many different types of churches, you will find many different types of organization. And so we're going to come to that a little bit later on as to why we think it's wise to organize ourselves the way we do uh, and why we relate to other churches the way we do. But this structure, this discussion we're having is called church polity. And so the description of what the Bible teaches about how a church should organize itself and govern its affairs, okay? How do we organize ourselves and how do we make decisions, including the nature and roles of members, and that was our subject last week, who are members and what do they do, and the leaders, as well as its relationship to other churches, right? So those are the kind of ideas, members, leaders, and our relationship with other churches, right? And if you're looking for a church, these are things that you should be literate in. One of the things we're going to talk about, and we described this last week, this was uh, this is how we describe who a church member is at Emmanuel, and we tried to give a biblical basis for church membership and why it is that it should be the case that you're united to a church and that you're known to be a follower of Jesus. It says to be a member means that a public formal agreement, a covenant, a mutual agreement, has been made between the church and an individual Christian. This formal agreement they enter into sets out the responsibilities of each party to the other, and notice here, this is interesting, this is not a uh, club, right, in terms of, you noticed you didn't get any hot towels when you got in this morning, uh, nobody put any chocolates out on your seat when you got there, we didn't, uh, we usually do provide coffee in pre-COVID era, maybe that'll return to us once again. Uh, have any of you heard that, that uh, progressive commercial, I know I'm giving a little time for progressive, I don't have any money in progressive. Uh, but if you've ever heard, heard that commercial where, you know, now for a snapshot of the 2019, and then what they give a snapshot is, is a couple is at a, at a restaurant and somebody's saying, you know, uh, table for Kowser is ready. Just, you know, memories of what 2019 was like because you can't do that in 2020, right? So pre-COVID, we actually had coffee here at the church, but now uh, you've got to do your own coffee before you get here. Some of you, it's worked out well. Others of you, I can tell it's not working out too well, but... Uh, as, you, as you come, right, to the church, this is not about a place where people are trying to figure out how to meet every one of your needs because you're coming as a consumer and you're judging us based on whether or not we're meeting your needs. You're coming as a producer who's been gifted by God with gifts and you're coming in here to minister as well as to be ministered to. So we're all gathering. An another metaphor that people have used of the church, which I think gets at this, is when you think of a church, it's a hospital. And we're all people who need to be cared for. Sometimes we're really broken and we need people to put us in an intensive care. But at the same time, the people who are the patients are the doctors. So the people who are caring for one another are all the people that are limping around as we're growing in Christ and we're understanding who he is as we're struggling with our own sin and we're struggling well, then we're leaning in to help other people. And that's who we are. Or there's not a group of people who are the consummate helpees, right? And we're the helpers. No, we're all coming in to serve one another. So the church agrees to affirm the Christian's relationship with God through Christ by the work of the Spirit. That is that they are saved or born again. And we're going to have a number of memberships throughout the rest of this month of people who've gone through the membership class. And you'll see them. They'll come because they have gone through a class to understand who they are in Christ and what a church is. They have given their personal testimony of how they've come to believe in Jesus Christ. And then when they come here, they're going to give that testimony to you. And we affirm them as followers of Christ based on their testimony. And then secondly, uh, we commit ourselves to oversee their discipleship. That now as they move in, right, uh, as they come into the church, well, we take responsibility as Sunday school teachers to disciple their children, to love them to Jesus. We take responsibility as men and women to encourage them to walk in the faith. If they come in as a married couple, we want to encourage their, their marriage to be strong and rich. If they come in as a single person, we want to come alongside of them to help them to navigate life and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Our commitment is to them to grow. And their commitment is the church promises to invest in and submit to them as they come in and say, I'm here, I'm opening my life to you for you to invest in me. And we say, yes, and we're going to invest in you. And by God's grace, that's what we mean. Now, so here, many of you are no, and I haven't gone through these for a while, but we have a number of values that characterize the, the body of Christ. 
And so this is where our understanding of membership is embraced by our value. We believe that every believer has been gifted and called to enable the body to grow into Christ. There are no spectators in the body of Christ, only spirit-empowered ministers of God's grace in Christ. Right? Uh, sports have fallen on hard times, right? And they continue to fall on hard times. But one of the things you always have with sports is you've got the, the guys or the women on the field, and then you've got all the stands spectating, right? Well, when you come to the church, there are no stands. There's no stands. There's no spectators. Everybody's on the field, and every day is game day, right? So when you walk in, if you have a mentality when you come into a church that I'm here to spectate and evaluate, you don't understand what God has called you to do and to be, right? Your job is to engage, right? And you're to be the people who are at linking arms with those around you to do that. Now, we move to our topic today about leaders, right? I'm sorry for all the scary pictures up there, but that's the best I could do uh, in terms of that. Uh, but those are our present pastors that we have right now. Uh, Sarah Mays is finally happy with me because she wanted Ron and I to update a picture. Really, it was my fault, not Ron's. To update a picture that, you know, I liked myself 20 years ago better than I liked the picture today. I said, why can't we keep it there, right? For some reason, people couldn't recognize me. I don't know why, right? So we, we had to update those. And, so there's a, and you can tell, which is, I want to point out something to you, which is the most uncharacteristic thing. I want you to notice that Van has a picture of himself with a tie. Now, you guys know Van. How many times does he wear a tie? Right? So I, false advertising right there. That's all I'm saying. Right? But there's Van and Janelle. That's his wife. And then to the left of them, that's, that's uh, Kim and Will Urschel. And then right above them is Emily and Steve Ruffner. And then, of course, you can recognize that's me. That's uh, Greg and Ronna Kauser. So that's the pastors here at Emmanuel. And so today we're going to answer these four questions. Who are the church leaders? Right? Uh, how do they become leaders? How are they organized? And what do they do? Right? And some of you have been wondering, like, do they do anything? Yes, we do do things. Right? So we're going to come at that. Okay? So let's talk about leaders. Oops, I'm stuck here a minute. Okay, there we go. Now here's Philippians 1.1. And uh, if you've got your notes there, you'll notice I just gave you four uh, places in the outline. I would encourage you to write down some key terms and, all, and especially to write down some of these verses, right? And you can go back and look at them. Here, I just give you an introduction to the book of Philippians. And I want you to notice when Paul's writing to the church, there's three categories of people. To the saints, that's the congregation, the people who believed in Jesus Christ and have therefore been set apart to him. They're the holy ones. Not because they have their whole lives together, but because they've been claimed by Jesus and set apart to him, okay? And they're growing. But notice here, to all the saints in Christ, Jesus, who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, okay? So overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And you'll see in this note over here, the New Testament consistently refers to two types of leaders in the church. To the pastor, elder, overseer, and those are all synonymous terms that refer to the one office, okay? They just describe it from different directions. Pastor is one that we're very familiar with in America. Pastor has to do with the idea that we're a shepherd. We're called to care for the sheep. Really, the idea of pastor is poimenes, which is just shepherd, right? We're a shepherd of the sheep. Well, what is the shepherd supposed to do? Watch over, care for, right? Feed the sheep, right? Guard and protect the sheep. That's what a shepherd is to do. The idea of an elder, an elder in the first century indicated a level of maturity on behalf of the leader, right? Normally speaking, right, this isn't always true, but in the church it should be true. It should be true that if you are years old in Christ, you should be more mature in Christ than somebody who just came to Christ. Should be, right? If you are a follower of Christ... And so in the first century, especially when they, they chose leaders, it, it was a person, the kind of idea of an elder was a deep knowledge of God, a real maturity that you needed age in order to gain that maturity. So age and maturity went together. There's just certain dimensions of your Christian life that you need time for. That's why there's a warning in 1 Timothy not, not to put a novice up there, right? Now, how much time? Well, that's not specified. But somebody who's just come to Christ, 
barely understands what Christ has done and who he is, let alone to lead other people to Christ. Right? So the elder is a connotation of maturity and age in terms of that. And then overseer has to do with the idea of having oversight over, spiritual oversight over the church. And then a deacon from 1 Timothy 3, the basic idea of someone who comes alongside the elders to serve at their bequest. Okay? Now, how do they become leaders, right? So how do people get in here? Well, we, we, it's not by vote in terms of uh, some democratic process. We won't have, you won't come to a manual and find uh, Van and, and uh, uh, Steve or Will and I putting out posters out here, right? We're in a political season. We're all going to be dead by the end of this political season, right? We're in a political season, but you're not going to find out, you know, posters out here as you turn into a manual. It says, vote for, vote for Van Holloway, Van Holloway for elder, right? You're not going to find any of that, right? Those kind of things. So how does a person become? Well, there's two things in Scripture that are consistently there. Okay, And if you've been around church for a while, you you know I'm going to differ with some of the ways it's described. Sometimes people will talk about a call to be a leader. Okay, Now, I don't have a problem with that in particular, but it's not usually used in the New Testament to describe how a person comes to be an elder. What it describes here in 1 Timothy 3, it says... This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, so what happens here is I think that God stirs up a desire in a person who's mature in Christ to say, I want to use my gifts in this role. Now, if you want to call that a call, you can. Scripture doesn't use that term to describe it. But it's a desire that I take it's from God that comes from the person, but the reason I don't like the idea of call, but even if I have a desire and I come to the church and say, I feel, I, I feel like I should be an elder, well, what Scripture makes really clear is that the congregation has to affirm that desire, that I can't walk up and say, you know, I just was praying the other day, and God called me to be a pastor, so I'm here. Make me a pastor. Uh, no, right? Scripture says, well, then you test them. You see if they meet the qualifications of an elder. And so anyone who comes here and is looking at being an elder, even if we're encouraging them to consider it, maybe you should think about this because of your maturity in Christ, we want them to know whether or not they have a desire because one of the qualities of an elder is they don't do it unwillingly. They don't do it by pressure. They do it because they believe God is enabling them and and leading them to do it, right? But still, nonetheless, when they come forward and say, I'd like to serve in that way, well, the church says, okay, well, let's look into your life. And I train people who are heading for the pastorate and training for missions, and and it's a kind of a job that you have to be prepared for because any other job you you would go to that would ask you the kind of questions that you have to ask a pastor, they would be illegal, right? Because it makes it very clear that the people who want to move a person into a pastor position, they should know that guy so well that they can say he's a genuine follower of Christ and we know he's not owned by anger, we know he's not owned by lust, we know he's not owned by greed, we know he is wise in terms of relationships, we know all these things, and that takes, uh, and that means uh, looking at the man's family, it means looking at his relationship with his wife, it means looking at all those kinds of things because the church is, is supposed to, once that man gets into office, they're to order themselves willingly under his leadership for the sake of the cause of Christ. He better be the right man because you don't want to unleash a wolf on the sheep. Right? So, and the same goes for deacons. Deacons come forward and notice here, deacons must be dignified and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons. Now, I want you to turn with me. Go to 2 Corinthians with me real quickly, would you? 2 Corinthians. And I want you to notice here that... Paul holds the congregation accountable for the kinds of leaders they have. You follow me with that? We're going to talk about congregational governance. So this is why if if you come to a manual, a person who comes forward for elder, if we recommend a person for elder position, for pastor position, the congregation has to affirm them. Because everywhere we find in the New Testament, the congregation is culpable for the kinds of leaders they have, which suggests that they have to be responsible for which leaders they have, right? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. Here's Corinth. There's some bad guys that the church is allowed to operate in their midst. And he says this, verse 1. I hope 
uh, you will put up with me in a, with a, in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion for Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit we received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Right? And Paul's going after them for the fact that the reason these bad eggs are running havoc on the body of Christ is because the people have allowed them to do that. Okay? Let me give you one more. Right? Come to 2 Timothy with me, chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's a famous passage where he's given admonition to Timothy. And notice what he says to Timothy. We'll back up to verse 2. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Preach the word, Timothy. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear, okay? So the issue is here is that this is why it's so important for us as a body to grow and mature in Christ and to know what the Scripture says because you all are responsible for ultimately who occupies this position. As a professor at Cedarville, one of the things that I'm so excited about the mission of Cedarville, and this isn't a promo for Cedarville, but one of the reasons I really like to be there is I get to teach this Bible minor that the vast majority of the students are not Bible majors. They're engineers, nurses, scientists, teachers, all kinds of things like that. But in our tradition, those are the people who are going to be occupying the pews, and those are the people who are going to be appointing the pastors by congregational vote. And as their maturity goes or lack of maturity goes, so goes the pulpit, right? Because you can, because there are enough religious charlatans anywhere you go that you can find someone that will tell you anything that you want to hear, right? You can find them in the name of Jesus who can tell you the craziest things, right? And the characteristic of a charlatan is they're sniffing the wind, they're feeling the wind because the goal of a charlatan is popularity, power, influence, money, right? And so they're vested in telling you what you want to hear because they don't want you to feel like you're being confronted by the scriptures of the truth because that could hurt their pocketbook, that could hurt their influence, right? So Paul keeps coming back all throughout the scripture and says, the only goal I have is to represent Jesus to you and then let the chips fall where they may, Okay? So the issue here is when it comes to leaders, right, they should be affirmed by the congregation based on the fact that they meet the qualifications of a mature believer. Okay, move on. How many are they and how are they organized, right? This is one of those things here. Well, churches have pastors, plural, and deacons throughout the New Testament. Okay, this is somewhat controversial, but not too much these days. And what I want to suggest to you that the single pastor model is not godless, it's not wrong in the sense of being unscriptural, but I would like to suggest to you that everywhere you read in scripture, it seems like that pastors are plural, right? James 5.14, you guys remember that passage, when a person is sick, you call for the elders, plural, right? Not for the pastor, you call for the elders, plural, right? When Timothy is appointed to the ministry, it's the laying on of the elders who do so. When Paul writes to the church at Philippi, the church at Philippi, he addresses the overseers and deacons, not the overseer, but the overseers, right? And this is much more for me to go after. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that it seems to be that a plurality among the leaders seems to be the norm of New Testament churches, okay? Many churches have that, they just simply call them staff members, and so you've got a, a paid uh, senior pastor, and then you've got assistant pastors and assistant pastors, and now we've got all kinds of corporate terms, executive pastors, and so forth and so on. Well, those essentially are the pastors that are governing the church. How they organize themselves, that's another question, but the issue here is that there seems to be a multitude of pastors or a plurality of pastors, not just one. Okay, We'll come back to that. And then the second issue 
is there's no explicit structure within the plurality. Okay? There's no explicit structure. The model that we have now where we, you hear in many churches, and this is, this is fine, you'll hear it, well, we have a senior pastor and then we have elders, right? And they distinguish between the person who does the preaching up here and the elders who do, do other pastoral tasks. Well, I don't have a problem with that kind of language, if you will, as long as all of those pastors are equal members at the table and it's not a hierarchy of responsibility because then it inserts something different there in terms of that. And so you have a pastor who, different elders who may be gifted to speak and they play that role, but you have different elders who do different things that are pastoral, but it isn't just relegated that the pastor's the only the guy who speaks up front, okay? So we'll talk more about that. I know these are controversial things that are falling out here, but I'm trying to give you an overview, and at times we'll go back and dig into that, and we've written and spoken on this many times. Uh, And then thirdly, any hierarchy among pastors appears to be occasional, And we'll talk about this. We have four pastors, right? This was hard. Uh, We've had people walk in and they'd say, who's your pastor? And I said, well, we have four pastors. No, no, who's your your pastor? I said, we have four. Well, no, no, I want to know who's the big man. And I said, we're all big men, but we don't have any pastor that way, right? So I resented that implication. No, I'm just kidding. No, but... The issue is, is that that's baffled people because we do have models. And again, I'm not saying it's ungodly. I'm not saying it's unscriptural. I'm saying that the organization of the pastors internally is not something specified by Scripture. Any more than we have no indication about how deacons are supposed to organize themselves. There's nothing in the Bible about the chairman of the deacon board. Right? So why do we do that? Well, it's wisdom that does that. Okay? So what we find in Scripture, we find elders conferring, and someone will come with a word, and someone, I agree to that, and they move forward, but it's not the person who's carrying the big stick who slams it down on the table and says, this is what we're doing, everybody else follow, okay? So the issue here, and then fourthly, historically, various church church structures arose in response to the needs of a rapidly expanding church, okay? If we had time to do this in terms of church history, often what you would find is a seasoned a mature, deeply knowledgeable spiritual leader became the mentor to a number of other pastors in given church areas. And sometimes it looks like a hierarchical structure, but it's just a structure that was developed in order to facilitate what these young pastors or young followers were. You will often find this on mission fields today. In Togo today, there are pastors who are leaders in terms of being the field, but their goal is to mature and launch these individual pastors and no longer have them under this kind of hierarchical structure, right? But those are wisdom issues in terms of church growth. Now, so the psalm is, it's a matter of wisdom for the time, not a biblical mandate. Now, I want to share with you real quickly about what I think the wisdom of our structure is, if you're wondering about ours. Four of us, we make decisions together. Uh, We don't take votes in our four so that we make decisions by three versus one. If, uh, if Van, which he does this all the time, Van is a big stick in the mud. No, I'm just kidding. He's not. But if Van were to stick his feet down and say, I disagree with the decision that you and Will and Steve are making, well, we would stop the train and we would say, okay, Van, if this is so important to you and so uh, uh, significant that you're willing to say no to all three of us in agreement, okay, then we need to talk about it and you need to lay your case on the table and we need to move this together, Right? So we move together, we make decisions with regards to that, and so we recognize with this that we have different strengths and weaknesses as men. One of the things that's difficult, especially for a single pastor, is he's often assumed to be the omnicompetent guy who does everything. And some of you, if you've had pastors, uh, single pastors, which I have in growing up, sometimes it means they're really, really strong in one area and weak in other areas. And if they're wise, they have people that complement their weaknesses. I've had pastors who are great truth speakers, great people from the pulpit, and they struggle to relate to people well. And it caused difficulties. I've had other people who are great people people, but they struggle up front. Different things along those lines. So we try to play to our different giftedness. We're deliberate about peer accountability, about holding each other accountable for how we live and what we say. We pray together every week as elders. We talk about our families and talk about our lives. Uh, we have 
struggled with our own struggles and insecurities with each other. We're deliberate about peer accountability uh, in terms of those. Fourth, third thing, uh, we intend it to be an iron that sharpens iron. I know one of the critiques that people will look at us and say, well, what if it becomes a, just an old boys club? What if it becomes a group of guys that just hang out together, right? And what I want to say in particular, there is no particular structure that will guard you from the darkness in people's souls, right? I don't care what structure you have, the structure itself will not secure people to be faithful. But what I'd like to suggest to you that the singular pastor who gets the top of the pyramid, he's often much more vulnerable than four men who are working together because the man at the top of the pyramid often gets to the point where he's the person who's giving advice and teaching and counseling everyone else, but nobody else gives him any counsel. Okay? So it could it go bad? Well, sure, if we go bad, sure could uh, in terms of that. But we have also things where we involve other people in our lives. I have accountability outside this group. So does Van. So does Steve. Those kinds of things. But we want it to be that kind of thing. It targets workload to gifting. Some of you know if I do a lot of the preaching. Steve does a second amount of it. Van and Will do less of that. Well, we do that according to gifting. Van is much more administratively adept, even though that's not his, the love of his soul, than I am. Will is a worker that just makes me want to sleep when I see him, right? If you know Will, I mean, he's just exhausting. That man has a schedule. Uh, I, my pushback to Will all the time is to get some sleep and don't do so much, right? But he just loves to serve people in a very active way. And Steve also is involved as a missionary, right? Uh, great skills in organizing, thinking about teaching, instructing, uh, those kinds of things. So we target that. It allows extensive connections to the body. I can have a group of people that I'm connected to, Van and so forth. So instead of what, having one pastor who's accountable for 250 to 300 people, we have four people that can break that up and have more extensive connections. And then attempts to model community and its operations. I mean, of all things, we as pastors should get along with each other. Right? And let me tell you, we don't always get along with each other well. And so I'll just be, be straightforward. One of the things I appreciate about these guys is that they're honest. And so um, one of us will remain nameless. It wasn't me, but one of us will remain nameless. Um, we had a situation this past week where we had a disagreement about something that was going on. And one of us sent out an email that just kind of burned my eyebrows off, right? So they've grown back. So they've grown back now. But it was good. It was honest, and it was good, and I sat there under it because I knew the man, and I knew his heart, and I responded. My very first words of the email were, ouch. That's what my first, and then I wrote back to him, and I said, you know, there's some good points here, and we need to think through this, and it resulted in us having a very deep discussion, and we're all back together again, but we're not sitting there just saying, that really aggravates me, and I'm just going to keep it stuffed, right? So, and a functional hierarchy appointed uh, with appointed leaders, right? So that's the wisdom. We can talk more about that. I would encourage you, this PowerPoint's going to be made available with this message so you can see it. Okay, a couple things. So here's our value statement. We believe that God desires that the body of Christ be led by elders and served by deacons under the leadership of those elders. We also believe that our structuring of those offices must allow the church to maximize the potential of its leadership to grow to protect the body, to enable the body, and to mobilize this body for the glory of God. Okay? You need to know right now, we as elders, we, we have connected with a number of men within our church that we've been praying with and challenging to consider stepping into the role as an elder. Uh, I'm not getting younger. Um, uh, Van and Will and Steve, they look as young as they ever have. Uh, I, was, I was actually uh, enjoying a, a picture that I saw of Van and Janelle uh, when we were first ordained as elders. I had to check twice and says, is that Van? That is Van. Who's that young boy over there? Right? So as come there, we want the next generation of men to step in to do these kinds of things, and that's where we're doing right now. We've had them doing some reading, praying, thinking about it. We're pursuing them, uh, so we want to do that. Now, given our schedule this morning, I'm going to pause right here. I'm going to come back next week and finish the rest of what we've set out here. But what we tried to establish today about who the leaders are, elders and deacons, how do they become leaders, they aspire to the position, they have a desire for it that's affirmed by the congregation, right? And then how are they organized? Well, that's a matter of wisdom. What we're going to find out is the, the pastors, the elders, the overseers, 
are the ones responsible for directing and guiding the body spiritually. The deacons serve under the elders to fulfill that, and we'll talk more about that next time. So that's how we're organized as we think here. Now let me give you one shameless plug here, okay? That membership class that starts up this Thursday. Two things, if you're new here, welcome here. Second, if you're a college student, welcome here and you're here. I want to encourage you, right, if, if you're here and you're thinking seriously about being engaged in the manual, please come to the membership class, right? We believe, not because we're trying to sign some deal or get control of you, we don't feel any of that. We feel that what we're trying to do is what God says is best for us to flourish together. And we think a real relationship between you and I is important, that I know you, that you know me, that we're working together as a body of Christ, and that we know who the people are who are linking arms together, submitting to the leadership here and moving forward. And so if you have a church membership at home, college students, this is not replacing that church membership, but it's saying you're away from your home for nine months every year. It's kind of hard for your church to be the church when you're here. And you need to come under and be involved. And you need, I'll say to college students, you don't need to be with 18 to 22-year-olds every day of the week. You need to step out and be with some old codgers like me, right? You need to be with some young moms and dads. You need to be around kids. You need the body of Christ because when you get done with Cedarville, that's where you're going to live out your life. You're not going to live it out with 18 to 20-year-olds that just get a pack and old to grow old together, right, while you live in the dorm together, right? That's not going to happen. Right? So don't do that. If you're here and you're on the edge of a manual and you say, I like to sit here, but I just don't want to commit, I just want to ask you why. Why? Are there broken people here? Yes. If you're coming here and you think you won't get hurt or someone won't do something stupid, well, then you're naive. And number one, you don't have a good self-assessment about yourself because we invite you in to join with us we get all the blessings and enablement that God has given you, and we get all your crap, too, right? Just like you get ours, right? It's not a one-way deal. And, and we, what we're, the reason why I'm at church, the reason why I'm here, not because everybody here is so great, even though I love the people that are here, not because it's a perfect, it's because I believe in Jesus. I'm honest with you. I believe in Jesus, and this is the way he said to, for me to follow him, and this is where I'm going to find safety and help, and I need people who can know me and call me out and love me and support me. I need him. My wife and I need him, right? And that's the real, it's obedience and trust, and I have found it to be true, and I'm hanging with this group of people, and they're hanging with me by God's grace because we want to love each other to Jesus and hold each other through difficult times, right? Celebrate God's goodness. All those things, okay? Now, just before we take our communion here, I want to give you instruction, and we're going to come back and have a time of reflection to kind of wrap things up. But I want you to appoint someone from your little group, right, your group or your family that's sitting together, and you will see on each side of the auditorium there are tables for our communion elements, would you appoint somebody from your group to go pick them up? And you don't have to worry about spilling them because they're all sealed, right? So you can have somebody. So count the people in your group and then step over here and try not to crowd on everyone. Grab those and once everybody's reseated, we'll begin. I just want to say, as you're moving around, thank you for, for wearing masks. I know that we all have different opinions on those things, and, and what we're trying to do is to make it maximally comfortable for the maximum number of people, and so we respect that people feel differently. Thank you for doing that. I, I, just honestly, I hate you having masks on. Um, uh, as a teacher at Cedarville, it's taking me forever to get to know my new students because it's hard to memorize their names just connected to their eyebrows and the nose, the bridge of their nose, right? Uh, so those are difficult. Uh, and, and with that, I want to encourage you to the degree that you're comfortable. When we finish today, 
We're going to provide, we're going to ask you to wait and be dismissed to go out, but we're going to provide space out in the parking lot for you to talk. Please hang around and talk to each other, right? You need to be embraced. And if you, if you feel, uh, you know, if you've got distance issues and you want to stay six feet, that's okay. And you want to keep your mask on, that's okay too, Right? And so respect one another in terms of that, but you need to engage each other, and we need not be a group of people who are like people who are walking in and out of the uh, operating room, right, in terms of those. So I'll encourage you with that. Now, Mike, can you put up my last slide, please? My last slide from my PowerPoint. This is a passage from 1 Peter chapter 5. And what I want to suggest to you here, it gets at everybody that's sitting here. It talks to the pastors, it talks to those of you that are the congregation. And then it talks to us together about what we're supposed to be doing. So here, what I want to, the reason why I'm putting this up for you, I want you to think before we come to communion, right? Now, what is communion? It's the procedure, the process, the ordinance, what God has ordained through Jesus Christ that his people should do as a picture of who they are, maybe even of whose they are, and what they're to do and to be. Okay? And so what the communion is, Jesus said, I've established this supper, and I want you to gather as my people regularly in my name and do this in remembrance of me. Okay? And so this is his table. He invites it. The only, only thing that you need to to come to this table is to believe in Jesus as your Savior. But that's a big thing. Because this is saying by taking this table, this, these elements don't do things to you. Right? There's nothing going to be said here today that changes that grape juice that's there and that little wafer that's there. And it's a sad little wafer. Let me just say this. That little sad little wafer, it's not going to do anything to that to do something to you. Right? Right? What that activity is doing, it's declaring something about you of what you've already done with Jesus. And it's picturing the events that made it possible for you to be, come out from underneath the just judgment that you deserve by being a rebel against God. And Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood so that your sin might be covered. He might take what you justly deserved and you're celebrating the fact that you get to enter into the benefits of his death that that was for you, and you're celebrating that, and you're reminding yourself that I owe everything genuinely to Jesus, everything. He's the center of life, the, the, the core of life, the purpose and mission of life. I owe it to him, and he gave it for me, and it reminds me of this new arrangement that I've entered into where he's given me the spirit to change me to a new person. It calls me into my new identity. I'm not supposed to live like I used to before because I've been given the spirit of God. He's made me new. And now he calls me into this new life, and I want to live this new life, and I want to proclaim his death by how I live and what I say until he comes back. And I'm living in hope. That's what this moment is. So if you're not a follower of Christ, I want to invite you to be a follower of Christ. But if you're not, integrity would demand of you that you don't want to participate today. Not because we're trying to cut him. We want you to reckon with Jesus. For us to encourage you that something can happen to you through this meal is the most hateful thing we could tell you. You need to reckon with Jesus, and we invite you to believe on him. If you have any questions about that, I'd love to talk with you about that. But that's what we're doing. So if you've believed in Christ, take these elements, right? And then we're going to do them together. Why? Because it's not only recognizing I'm united with Jesus. It's saying that now we're all brothers and sisters. And if you've been around here for a while, you've heard me say this over and over again. I have more real, lasting bonds genuine deep connections with everyone who believes in Jesus than I have with my nearest blood relative who has rejected Jesus. That's where we are today. And sometimes we don't want to take up that identity. We don't want to take up that responsibility. But I am your brother. You are my sister. You are my brother. And I want to be that to you. And I want to identify with you. And we need, to, we need each other for the sake of Christ. And matter of fact, our ability to witness to Christ is going to be shown by how we love each other or don't, right? So that's what we're doing today in this. And so this reminds us in light of what's happening here. And so as we, before we reflect, I'm just going to read this passage. And I'm going to ask, you know, I come before the Lord. Lord, am I being this kind of elder? 
Lord, am I being this kind of church member? Lord, are we doing these things together? And maybe it's a time where in God's mercy, he's saying, okay, you guys are missing the mark here. This is where we need to repent and change our direction. So whatever you need to clean up with the Lord, you do that here. We're going to give a little bit of time to do that, and then we're going to come and celebrate. So as your fellow elder and witness of Christ's sufferings, and as one who shares in the glory that will be revealed, I urge the elders among you, give a shepherd's care to God's flock among you, exercising oversight, not merely as a duty, but willingly under God's direction, not for shameful profit, but eagerly. And do not lord it over those entrusted to you, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades. In the same way, you are younger. And here he uses the idea of the mature believers as the elders, as the leaders. And now those of you who follow those mature believers, be subject to the elders. And all of you, all of us, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And God will exalt you in due time if you humble yourselves under the mighty hand by casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. I, I just have to pause here for a moment. I think of Samuel's phrase that God, God saved me from sinning against my brothers and sisters by not praying for them. Now, I just really encourage you, one of the things that we watch over each other is that you need to be sensitive to one another and be praying for each other. Your hearts are going to be drawn out toward each other. And that's one of those ways that we can go after that because the evil one is at work. He wants to devour our unity. He wants to devour our patience. He wants to devour our, our, our uh, focus on Jesus. He wants to do all those things. And we're under attack and we're naive and stupid if we're not actively posing. Okay. resist him strong in the faith because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are enduring the same kinds of suffering and after you have suffered for a little while the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you to him belongs power forever now we're just going to pause take a moment, ask the Lord to search your heart clean things up with him and then let's come together and celebrate this communion together Father, all week I've been, Lord, thank you to that phrase, Lord, that uh, when Solomon established the temple, uh, the musicians were singing over and over again, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Oh, we're just so grateful that you're good. Lord, that today, no matter how difficult the day is, Lord, you're a good God who's at work trying to draw us to life. Lord, for the the unbeliever who may be with us, someone who's never turned to you, Lord, you're at work, Lord, trying to bring them to the end of the dead end of a life apart from you. Lord, you want them to know life and have it to the full. And Lord, for us as your followers, Lord, we, we keep listening to the siren calls of the culture around us. And, it, it, and it, it distorts our marriages. It distorts our friendships. Lord, it, it distorts our perspective on who we are as the people of God. And Lord, we, we, we get puffed with pride. We want to be elevated. We want everyone to focus on us. We want our way. And Lord, we complain and cry and self-pity, Lord, when we don't get our way. Just saying, I deserve better than this. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us for people uh, who lose sight of who you are and lose sight of our identity, lose sight of our calling. Lord, please draw us back into the truth of what you have done for us. Lord, remind us that we were rebels and we've been rescued. Lord, the cross declares that we were so bad off that we couldn't help ourselves, but it also declares that we were so loved that we can't imagine. Lord, draw us back into that truth. Remind us, Lord, that we don't have to give in to sin, and we're not owned by it. Lord, we have the Spirit of God within us. We have the potential in Christ 
to say no. And Lord, we are called to each other to help each other walk through the darkness and things. Lord, help us not to succumb to the regrets of our past. Lord, help us not to come, uh, uh, succumb to the, the judgments of our society in terms of what makes us valuable. Lord, help us, Lord, to see ourselves in your sight, to be your people. Lord, we want to proclaim by our lives and our words that you have died to free and rescue, Lord, until you come. So Lord, help us, we pray, as your people, in the name of Christ, amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a very familiar passage here, and here I want to encourage you just to try to take off, if you can, in this uh, very delicate operation that we have here. I always seem to struggle to get just the wafer cover off first. I don't know if that's your particular problem. I'll just confess my sins while we're here, Um, and I think I'm failing right now. Oh, there it is. I don't like that sound as a part of our communion, but it is what it is. Here's what, here's what Paul says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, this new arrangement that I have made possible by virtue of my death. This new arrangement where I'm going to put the Holy Spirit within you. I'm going to make you a new person. I'm going to give you an an unfailing hope and security in me. I'm going to empower you for mission. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray. God, I I know for so many years I've mentioned this to, Lord, some of us honestly, as we're sitting here today, we're dead to the significance of this moment. And Lord, we need help by the Spirit to reawaken us to the wonder of your grace, your undeserved favor being lavished on us in Jesus. Lord, soften our hearts, deepen our appreciation. Lord, root us more deeply in in the fact that that your love is so high, it's so deep, it's so wide. Lord, it's unconscious, it's it's unfathomable, Lord, what you have done for us. Lord, overwhelm us. Lord, let our lives be more and more constrained by love. I pray. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the opportunity to join arms and walk together.